In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are fast approaching the end of the season of Easter, marked by Pentecost Sunday. And our readings appear to be chosen to prepare us for the coming of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Our gospel reading is taken from John chapter 14, verses 15 to 31. And if you have your Bibles open, you can follow. Now let us first set this passage in the context of the gospel as a whole. It is the section found in the second part of the gospel called the Book of Glory or the Book of the Passion, beginning at chapter 13, verse 1. And chapters 14 to 16 constitute what is called the farewell discourse. Jesus is just days before his death and he knows that the disciples are deeply troubled at the prospect of his leaving them. And so he seeks to comfort them and to reassure them. There are various strands to the discourse, but in this passage, in chapter 14, verses 15 to 31, he focuses on the Holy Spirit. Now let us notice firstly, that he is addressing his disciples and he describes them by their love for him, manifested in obedience to his commandments. He says in verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. The thought is repeated in verse 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he adds in verse 24, whoever does not love me does not keep my words. He has already told them that the time has come for him to leave them and to return to the Father. In verses 2, 3, and 4. And he's tried to reassure them. Let not your hearts be troubled. The passage begins, chapter 14 begins with those words. But now he's a bit more specific. We know from the birth narrative that the prophet Isaiah had prophesied that the Messiah would be Emmanuel, Emmanuel, which means God with us. And there is little question, but that the disciples had learned to count on Jesus's presence with them in every circumstance. He had been their master, their leader, their counselor, and they were troubled that they would feel as abandoned as orphans when he left them. Jesus reassures, reassurances are to the point. I will not leave you orphans, he says. I will come to you, in verse 18. And in verse 16, he says, the father will give you another advocate or counselor. Jesus is telling something remarkable when he tells them that through the Holy Spirit, his presence will continue to be with them. In verse 25 onwards, he explains all this a little more. He has already referred to them as those who love him and obey him. And he now explains how the Holy Spirit will help this to happen. The Holy Spirit, he says, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. In this way, he will enable them to live in obedience and the result will be peace. So he says in verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. So let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. There's so much in this passage that rings bells for us who live during the church age and demonstrate our love for the Lord Jesus by living in obedience to what we know of his will. There's a fundamental difference, no doubt, between the original disciples and us, for they had the privilege of knowing the Lord Jesus in the flesh. But the passage makes it clear 
that we are in no way disadvantaged for the, through the Holy Spirit, he continues to be with us all that he was to the first disciples. The book of Acts, of course, begins with the day of Pentecost. And is the story of how the early church began to proclaim the good news of Christ and how the church spread across the Roman Empire. In the second part of the book, the focus is on Paul the Apostle. And our next reading is taken from Acts chapter 16, verses 6 to 15. This records in part Paul's second missionary journey when he moved westwards across Asia Minor and on into the southern part of Europe. The passage, Acts chapter 16, verses 6 to 15, divides up into two. And in each section, we get glimpses of what the Spirit means to the church. During his ministry, the Lord Jesus took the lead as he moved across the land of Israel with his disciples. There were occasions when one or more of the disciples had questions regarding Jesus' decisions to move to a particular place, but they submitted to his better judgment. This passage in Acts indicates that, the lead, that that leadership role is now taken by the Holy Spirit. That this is so is quite clear in, this, in verses 6 to 10 of Acts 16. As Paul and his companions traveled on their second evangelistic tour, we first read in verse 16 that they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Then, when they attempted to go in the direction of Bithynia, we read that the spirit of Jesus did not allow them to do so. Finally, through a dream or a vision, Paul concluded that God had called them to preach the gospel to the Macedonians. This phenomenon of the spirit leading them reappears in the rest of Luke's record of Paul's evangelistic journeys in the book of Acts. This, of course, is an important part, aspect of the Spirit's role during the church age. On the other hand, it assumes a posture of openness and sensitivity on the part of the church to the Spirit's leading. If our relationship to the Lord is one of loving obedience, he will lead us in the paths of righteousness. In the second section of the reading, we have an example of another aspect of the ministry of the Spirit through the church. Paul and his evangelistic team are in Philippi. And on the Sabbath, they share in worship with a group of women in a place of prayer outside the city. This was because there was no synagogue, because there were certain rules that you had to have a certain number of married men in the city to establish a synagogue. And so people who wanted to worship were worshiping unofficially in small groups outside the city limits. Paul and his team preached the good news of Christ during their worship with this group of women. In the group was a woman called Lydia. And we read in verse 14 that the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Consequently, Lydia responded to the gospel in faith and she and her household were baptized. We have a clear example here of what, of the two sides of the experience of salvation. The Lord took the initiative through the prompting of the spirit, it says, to open Lydia's heart. But on her part, she paid attention to what she was hearing. As someone has said, faith 
is reaching out empty hands to receive God's gift of salvation. God gives, but we need to receive. There's no merit in faith, but we need faith to receive God's gift. Whether it be forgiveness, whether it be reconciliation, whether it be restoration, whether it be guidance, we need faith to receive what God is offering to us. And that brings us then to Revelation chapter 21, verse 10, yeah, just an introductory verse, and then from 21, verse 21, uh, verse 22, to chapter 22, verse 5, just two paragraphs. During the season of Easter, one of our readings has been regularly taken from the book of Revelation. And that's the case today as well. In 21 verse 10, we are told that John the seer was carried away in the spirit to a great high mountain and shown the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Now, the language used here in this verse is very similar to that used in verse 2 of chapter 11, 21, where John tells us that he saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from, from God. In that passage, he goes on to describe the new city as a bride adorned for her husband. However, he adds that he heard a loud noise from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people. This emphasis on God's presence with his redeemed people is now developed further in the rest of our selected reading from chapter 21, verses 22 to 27. John tells us that he saw no temple in the city, for the temple is the Lord God. In the Old Testament, in the wilderness wanderings, and later on in the promised land, the tabernacle first, and then the temple represented God's promised presence among his people. These symbols of God's presence pointed forward to the coming of Messiah, whose name was Emmanuel, God with us. And now, here in the New Jerusalem, the entire city is a temple, for the Lord God was with his people. In the remainder of the paragraph, various other points are made. Because the God, because God dwells among his people, it, we read, his glory will give the city its light. The city will have no need of sun or moon to shine on it. And John adds, by its light will the nations walk and nothing unclean will ever enter the city. There are clear indications that here that the new Jerusalem represents the consummation of God's plan of salvation of fallen, sinful humankind. This is further confirmed in the following paragraph, the first paragraph of chapter 22, 22 verses 1 to 5. John, we read, is shown that the river of the water of life bright as crystal, flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb right through the middle of the city and on its banks will be the tree of life. This tree of life, John is told, is for the healing of the nations. Both positive and negative points make it clear that this is the consummation of the story of salvation that began in the Garden of Eden. There too, we have a river, Genesis chapter two, verse 10, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which the first humans were forbidden to eat. 
Unfortunately, they disobeyed that directive and were consequently sent out of the Garden of Eden, banished from God's presence. Here in Revelation 22 verses 1 to 5, those who have received God's salvation are now back in God's presence in the new Jerusalem. We read in verse 3, chapter 22, verse 3, that they will worship God, seeing him face to face and with his name on their foreheads. That is probably a symbol of belonging. So let us now sum up. The focus of our readings on an important, is on an important aspect of the story of salvation, that humans were created for fellowship with the creator. As someone put it, we were made in the image and likeness of God. But as fallen creatures, we have a God-shaped void in our lives that is filled when we come to place our faith in the saving work of Christ on the cross. Once that void is filled, we are restored to fellowship with God mediated through the spirit during the church age. And we live in hope of dwelling in the new Jerusalem, the very temple of God. What more can we ask for? Hallelujah.